My name is John Milton, and uh, I served uh, in the United States Navy uh, for uh, about two years uh, after I graduated from high school. During high school, it happened to be from uh, Rock Island High School, Rock Island, Illinois, where I graduated. But I have to say, during the high school years, uh, the war was going on, and so those of us who uh, were in high school knew that uh, the day would come when, uh, if the war didn't end, we would be in the United States military service. It was something we all anticipated. And therefore, unfortunately, uh, the emphasis wasn't on studies. Uh, for the women, of course, it was, but they're the ones who carried their books home at night. The men never did. I was an aviation storekeeper, petty officer, third class. My assignment when I, when, when I joined the Navy, uh, I had my boot camp training in, in Williamsburg, Virginia. And from there, they put us on a troop ship and sent us out to San Francisco to Treasure Island. I was there for a month, uh, assigned to the battalion headquarters to assign uh, the two, to deploy the, the, the others who were coming behind me. I got tired of doing that for a month, and so I put, I put my name in to take the first ship that leaves uh, the Hawaiian Islands for the South Pacific. I was put on the USS Breckenridge and landed at Pearl Harbor, and there they assigned me to different things, and I was put in a group to stay at the Hawaiian Islands and served my time at the uh, Naval Air Station at uh, Honolulu. It was not a state at that time. It was, it was a territory, so only uh, military planes were coming in. There were no domestic planes coming in. But my assignment uh, for a typical day was to work the graveyard shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, for most of that time, and since the war had just ended, the deployment of, of our military and the shipping back of all of our supplies and military equipment uh, had to be uh, done. And so I spent a lot of time on a finger lift, forklift, doing that kind of work, the graveyard shift, most of the time. Military people were coming back uh, from having served in in uh, the South Pacific on a host of ships in many, in many islands. So I had the opportunity to deal with, with them and their belongings as they came back. Uh, it was kind of an impressive thing to, to understand what was going on during that time. I joined on uh, February 1st, 1946, and I served uh, until I, my assignment was for two years, but the government was trying to save money at that time, so they, they gave us a chance to be discharged two months early so the government would save money, because much of our job had been completed by that time. There were a, a lot of military personnel who had uh, come home before I did, so they picked off the job, so there were no jobs available. And my father said, maybe you ought to consider going to Augustana College, which was only three blocks away from my residence. So uh, it, it was very simple because of the GI Bill. And uh, I, I talked to the registrar who was uh, a friend of our family. And so he signed me up uh, to, to, to to, to go to college, and then finishing at Augustana College, uh, what am I going to do? And again, no jobs. And so I decided to uh, go into hospital administration, and I went to uh, Northwestern University to got, and got a degree in, uh, in hospital administration. When I was in the military service, it turned out that my close friend who joined the Navy the same time I'd, I did was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean 
on a board ship, and I was sent to the to the Pacific uh, Ocean, serving my time in uh, the Hawaiian Islands before it was a state. It was a territory, and I wrote letters he, to him, and he wrote letters to me. I never saved the letters, but he did, and I learned that after he died, when his daughter went through his possessions, and she saw these letters that I had written to him, and she wanted to know if I wanted them, and if I didn't, she said, I, I'd like to get them back and save them. I said, no, I'd love to have them. So I have those letters in my possession. And it came up in our discussion because th that triggered the, the idea of, of how important it is to stay in contact with people. And especially nowadays with technology, of course, I, like most people, use internet and uh, use email. But when it comes to a letter like this, this is not an email letter. You can't delete it. It's a letter that uh, you either toss or you save. And all of my grandchildren have told me they've saved these letters. So when I'm long gone, it's my hope now that somebody will put them into a book form so that they could pass it on to their future uh, generations. When my oldest grandson was gradu going to graduate from high school in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, uh, I said to myself, I see him for a week in the summer and a week maybe at Christmas time. How else would I see him? And so I decided I would start to write him a letter just to make contact with him uh, for the first of each month. And so I, all through high school, I mean, all through college, he received the letter at the first of each month. My second grandson comes along two years later. So naturally, I had to do the same thing for him. So I've done this for all seven grandchildren. All, six of them have graduated from college recently. One is at the University of Purdue at the present time. So I've written these letters. Uh, each letter includes a three paragraphs, uh, a one-page letter. The one f first paragraph is usually uh, something simple, something uh, personal between he, that person and me. The second paragraph is topical. Uh, it relates to some topic. The third paragraph relates to uh, something spiritual. And uh, uh, the topics have been interesting. The one that's going out, in fact, is ready to be mailed for December, uh, has to do with uh, a, 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 a more of a, more of a uh, educational kind of thing. Uh, generosity is one of the topics that I've used. Uh, the next one for January will be on the subject of of gratitude, uh, and the one prior to this happened to be on the subject of words. I've indicated that words are important. They can be uh, hateful, they can be loving, and uh, therefore uh, it's important uh, how you use words. Once you utter a word, I tell them, you don't get it back, it's gone. And it, it could be something either you're happy about or you're sorry. So watch what you say. Uh, and so as it's turned out, all, the, all of the grandchildren have received a letter the first of every month. The oldest one who graduated from college, my wife said I should continue to do it. He's been out of college four years. He's received a letter every, the first of every month for those four years. So if one were to count the number of letters uh, that I've sent, it's probably uh, over, uh, close to 400 letters. Uh, and I put a little cash in the letter to make it savvy. Uh, and I've had some interesting responses. One of them, one of my uh, granddaughters who uh, lives in the Washington, D.C. area, has indicated that when she goes to bed at night, she frequently pulls out one of the letters and reads that before she falls asleep. Uh, another one told me he was a 
student at the Indiana University, and he was going to drive his car. Uh, it actually was my used car, but uh, he, he would have the car to drive from Indiana to Boston, where he lived. He got in the car and started driving and realized he did not have uh, enough gas to get him home. So what should he do? He looked down on the seat of the car. He noticed his mail was there, and the letter that I had sent to him was there. He knew there'd be a little cash in the letter, and so he opened that so he could buy some gasoline uh, to get to get home. I didn't, you know, feel like I was doing anything special at the time, but I just started doing it, and then I made myself do it every single month. So for uh, eight years now, yes. uh, I've not missed a single month in eight years. So the December letters are on my desk upstairs ready to go, and uh, that's the one on generosity. Right. And I indicated in that letter that generosity isn't always money, it's, uh, it's other things. And uh, I have one uh, daughter-in-law, her husband runs a hospital up in, up in New York, but she told me recently that when she wakes up in the morning, uh, she's a nurse, she, she says, I want every morning, to, I mean, I want every day to have something where I have helped somebody do something. And I said, well, give me an example. And she said, well, the funny one recently was, I was in the, in the uh, supermarket shopping, and this man was looking for the, uh, for the um, uh, uh, marshmallows, and he couldn't find where they were, and she knew where they were. So she took him over to the marshmallow counter, and he got kind of disgusted. You don't need to help me, and so forth. And so she said, okay. But she said when we checked out, he came over to her after he got checked out and said, I want to thank you for helping me. And so she didn't think that was going to turn out all that well, but it really did. And she said, every day I th try to think of one person that I can help. I'm very blessed for what I, re I, what I have. I, first of all, have an outstanding woman as my wife. Uh, and we have three great children, all of whom have reached high achievement. They all have outstanding spouses. And they produced, as I said earlier, uh, seven uh, grandchildren, and they all have been able to be employed now uh, after uh, being graduated a couple years ago. But uh, I say that I was blessed with the opportunity of having a rewarding and satisfying career. What else could I ask for? And so I feel my life has been a, a total success.